You, of course, need no introduction. Yeah, we can see you uh, and your, your slides. So, um, of course, you need no introduction with the prolific uh, research that you've been doing in um, recommender systems for um, what, over two decades now, I guess, right? Uh, probably more. Yes, I guess, I guess I was doing some of this research before it was called recommender systems. That's right. <laughs> and, um, you know, so uh, it's, it's uh, you know, we're grateful to you to have taken out the time to talk to us today. Uh, it's a great opportunity for the folks here. And, uh, you know, we are streaming on, on YouTube. So uh, for posterity, there will be people who will be able to listen to uh, what you uh, are going to discuss today. So thanks again. And I shall hand over to you. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, Sarah, and uh, thanks for the invitation. Um, <clears throat> looking forward to uh, talking to you about uh, some of the work we've been doing, in this case, about context-aware uh, recommendation and context adaptation in recommender systems. Um, and Sarah mentioned that I've been working in, in this area for quite a long time, and actually he has been a culprit in that, uh, in that work. Uh, from very early on. So some of that work goes back to some collaboration that we had for several years in, I guess, early 2000s and, uh, and some years later than that. So in any case, um, I'm Bamshad Mubashur. I'm at the DePaul University in uh, Chicago, USA. And today I'm gonna be talking about some uh, work related to uh, context aware recommendation. This is some of the work that we do at uh, Center for Web Intelligence at DePaul. So um, I understand that uh, most of you are uh, somewhat familiar with the idea of recommender systems uh, and some of the basic principles and algorithms. So I'm not going to go into too much detail. I'll just maybe start with a brief background on recommender systems. Then I'll talk about general views of context and the relevance of the notion of context in the recommendation problem. And why it's important, why it makes sense to try to incorporate context in recommender systems. And uh, then the bulk of the time, I'm gonna uh, talk about a couple of different approaches uh, that we have used in our research for a couple of different uh, applications or problems. Uh, one of those involves this side notion of latent variable context models. And I'm going to look at, show you an example of uh, this particular uh, uh, idea in the context of music recommendation. And uh, then we'll talk about a situation where you have a very dynamic context uh, that is uh, not statically uh, observable. Uh, or represent re can be represented uh, statically and uh, and in real time uh, basically you need to kind of understand what the context is and adapt to it and we'll talk about how to use this idea of multi-arm bandit algorithms to try to uh, handle this kind of situation so uh, as i said you're familiar with recommender systems so generally speaking these are information filtering systems that attempt to uh, generate personalized content for users and personalized content, broadly speaking, could be really anything, products, video, music, book, news, restaurants, web pages, text, um, and so on. And uh, maybe uh, even playlists, music playlists, for example, and so on. But the key is that they are tailored, this content is tailored to the needs or the preferences of the user. So these systems use machine learning often to learn uh, from user preferences and build models that can then predict what users might uh, want to view or see or, uh, or consume uh, in the future. So there are many examples of these, of course. Most of us uh, use many systems these days online, uh, many uh, uh, different uh, websites that are uh, quite prominent, including Amazon, for example, that uses recommendations technology where we can provide ratings or we make purchases and, and uh, it can give recommendations. Netflix or other kinds of video streaming services that uh, provide recommendations. Uh, uh, when you go to Netflix, um, almost everything is personalized based on uh, prediction models, including each row that you might see in different categories and so on. Um, 
even music services uh, such as Pandora or Spotify in this case uh, that can give you recommendations. So uh, we, we can see that this becomes has become uh, quite an important technology. In fact, many of these uh, examples that I'm showing you are uh, kinds of companies that whose primary business model actually relies on the idea of personalized recommendation. Now, traditional recommendation approaches uh, include what we call collaborative filtering, which is the idea of recommending items to a user based on preferences of other similar users. Uh, there are content-based filtering models where you recommend items with similar content or features to items that the users has seen before or has expressed interest in. And uh, more generally, there are a lot of hybrid approaches which sort of combine aspects of these two or combine multiple collaborative filtering models or uh, combine data from different kinds of sources, including collaborative data or content-based data or, or even uh, social uh, network data. And for each one of these, by the way, there's many different uh, algorithms exist. And I'm, my goal here today is not to go through all sorts of different algorithms, but, uh, but to sort of uh, highlight the notion of extending these, uh, th these methods or recommendation in general with the idea of context. One thing I should say beforehand is that often we think of recommendation as a rating prediction problem. So you, you know, in general, as a general kind of a setting, you can think about two entities that are users and items in our environment. And you can think about the utility of an item I for a user U to be represented by uh, some rating value uh, from let's say some set of ratings. This could be, uh, these ratings could are you know, often explicit, like uh, for example, one to five rating or maybe a thumbs up or thumbs down uh, kind of a binary rating, but they could also be derived implicitly. Even though we don't often call them ratings, you could kind of implicitly drive uh, uh, basically or try to understand the user's interest, degree of user's interest or utility of an item for a user. So let's just call those ratings uh, altogether. So each user typically rates a subset of items or expresses interest in some subset of items. And the task of the recommender system is to then try to estimate the unknown ratings. So in other words, try to extrapolate the rating function R based on the known ratings. And the rating function R is a function that maps users and items to, to ratings. And of course, it's a partial function. So it's not uh, full, completely defined for all user item pairs. And the goal is to try to uh, extrapolate those ratings for those unknown, uh, the unknown ratings. And of course the recommendations to each users are made by offering items with the highest predicted rating. Now, typically um, you can uh, sort of, as a general kind of a framework, you can uh, think of a situation where you have users and ratings again, uh, something similar to this, let's say a rating matrix some of this rating matrix is, uh, uh, the ratings are unknown. The idea is to, uh, given the observed ratings, user item uh, pairings basically, learn a model that predicts the missing ones. And often this, uh, this uh, uh, model is, is learned uh, using uh, some kind of a, uh, using by, by trying to uh, basically minimize some kind of a loss function. It's not the only approach, but that's a pretty common approach. In fact, probably the most common um, and very prominent application of this or example of this is matrix factorization, which became very prominent uh, after the, uh, uh, the Netflix uh, competition in 2007, 2008. Um, and the idea of matrix factorization, of course, is that you start with uh, your uh, ratings, sort of users versus items, for example, movies, if you're talking about Netflix. And uh, you use the known ratings in this uh, R matrix to try to infer or learn uh, these two factor matrices, uh, the user factor matrix or feature matrix and the movie feature matrix. And basically what you're learning are these latent features that 
can be used to uh, as a representation of users and items. And once these are uh, these factor matrices are learned, basically the task of predicting uh, this unknown rating in uh, the original uh, matrix is to do a dot product basically of a given user and a given uh, movie for which we are trying to generate predictions. So these factors, of course, these latent factors represent sort of combinations of features or characteristics of items and users that, uh, that uh, basically explain why uh, a user, explains the user's interest basically in a given item. For content-based recommendation, the idea is a little bit different because predictions for unforeseen or the target item are based on the similarity of those items, usually in terms of some features or content features to other items that in the user's profile. So you can imagine maybe the user watched several movies as part of their profile or rated them highly, uh, which has certain features. In this case, uh, I think most of these have, uh, or all of them have Bruce Willis as, uh, as an actor, and maybe uh, some of them have some similar directors like M. Night Shyamalan. So given some similarities among some of these content features, then the system might recommend other items that have some similar uh, content features. Of course, the content-based approach is much more useful when you have fairly rich uh, set of content features. So when you have text features, for example, uh, like when you're talking about documents or news stories and so on, this becomes uh, uh, more useful. So uh, content-based recommendation, for example, is quite useful when you're dealing with uh, news context, like news recommendation. All right, so probably all of this is uh, um, familiar to you already. One thing that I want to talk about is the idea of context in recommendation. So one thing that none of the what we talked about so far sort of deals with is the fact that users interact with systems within a particular context. And the issue is that the items that are relevant in one context may not be relevant in some other context. And I'm keeping the definition of context pretty general here right now, but uh, the fact is, is in some situations, you may like some item and in a different situation, that particular item may not have the same utility. And I'll talk about some examples of that. But here's one example. Suppose I um, talk about movie Frozen um, I may not like that movie by myself. So I, if I had to rate it, you know, in terms of my own preference for it, if I'm watching it alone, I probably would not rate it very highly. But if I'm watching it with, let's say, a child, that might be a good children movie. So in that context, I may give it a higher rating. There are lots of other situations where uh, the uh, context, changes in context may result in changes in preferences. Here is another example. Uh, suppose that, uh, let's say I'm at work and then I'm driving home and maybe when I'm driving, I'd like to listen to modern folk music, for instance. So here are some examples. But let's say I get home and then I decide to go exercise. Well, modern folk music may not be the best uh, when you're exercising, let's say you're running or swimming or doing something along those lines. So maybe something more upbeat, like electronic or dance music might be more useful in that context. Then maybe if I'm settling down to have dinner, maybe I want some background music like smooth jazz or something uh, slower in the background uh, to sort of uh, be, uh, you know, uh, to be background for my uh, romantic dinner, for instance. And maybe later on, if I'm relaxing, I want some uh, classic guitar. So the idea is that even within the same day, let's say that I'm going from context to context or situation to situation, uh, these changes in context actually result in changes in my preferences. So a song that might be appropriate uh, for my recommender system to, uh, 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 to add to my playlist when I'm exercising uh, is probably not the same, uh, not as appropriate when I'm as when I'm relaxing. 
there are many other situations this kind of thing can happen as well um, in e-commerce context for example let's say I'm, uh, let's say I'm interested in cameras or photography so I may be browsing through cameras or uh, maybe a, a, a camera uh, uh, you know lenses and so on uh, in uh, on Amazon for instance and um, later let's say that at some in some other session let's say i'm looking at books on recommender systems and machine learning because that's related to my work and my research and my teaching and yet in another context maybe i'm looking at toys or uh, in order to get a gift for let's say a friend's child maybe uh, my neighbor's child has a birthday or something like that i'm looking for that so recommendations in let's say this context are not going to be appropriate in this other context. So ideally, what I want is my system to be able to, first of all, recognize what these contexts are. Secondly, recognize that there are changes occurring in these contexts. And therefore, uh, I need to update my models or, act, or adapt the recommendations to those contextual changes. So that's sort of the overall um, problem that uh, we want to be able to address. Now, there are different views of context. And uh, this work actually goes back uh, to, uh, you know, early to early to mid 2000s. Um, but uh, Paul Durish in particular distinguished between kind of two views of context. One is this notion of representational view. The other one is this notion of interactional view. Much of the work that's been done in context-aware recommendation research, uh, has been uh, uh, for uh, with with representational view of context. The reason it's called representational view is because you assume that the context can be represented as an explicit, enumerated set of uh, uh, static attributes. So, for example, date, location, mood, device, time, all of those things could be variables or uh, or features that uh, that or that define the context characteristics so if i'm watching a movie at a given uh, in a given location uh, on a given device maybe at a given uh, time of the day or something like that uh, you know that would be the context for that particular interaction but at a different time or a different location or a different device uh, it might be uh, um, that would be a different context the implication of this representational view, of course, is that relevant contextual variables have to be known basically at design time. So we would have to know what uh, uh, what uh, what are those features that define context, and of course, we have to record information related to those uh, as we kind of uh, observe user interactions. So you can imagine that maybe the data that we normally have where you have users and items, and then you have some rating associated with those would look more like this, right? Let's say I have three context features, time, location, and companion uh, when I'm watching a movie. So I could be watching the same movie um, on a weekend, on a weekday, uh, maybe in theater or at home, maybe with family or alone. And uh, you could have the same user, for example, in this example, I have U1, who has watched Titanic in one case on a weekend in a theater with family and gave a rating of four, but maybe on a weekday at home and alone, you would give it a different rating, right? So you can have different ratings, basically different utilities for the same item and the same user uh, given a different contextual situation. One way to think of it is that function we were talking about, which maps users and items to ratings are, is now mapping users, items, and context to ratings, where context itself is basically a combination of several features. So this is sort of an abstract view of contextual or a representational view of context. And there are lots of different methods that uh, people have used um, uh, in, uh, in the realm of representational recommendation frameworks. Uh, this includes uh, contextual pre-filtering. The idea of pre-filtering is that uh, you have the data, such as the data we were just looking at, that includes contextual information. Uh, 
And what you do is basically then you isolate the context you're interested in. So that's just kind of a subset of the data. And then you, for that particular subset, you use standard kind of a two-dimensional recommender systems where you just have users and items, but for a subset of data within that context. And the models that you build are only based on that subset of the data. So it's called contextual pre-filtering. Contextual post-filtering is kind of the other side of the, uh, the coin, basically. So we sort of build a standard recommender system without considering the context. But then in the output, we sort of filter the output out and remove from consideration those recommendations that don't fit the particular context that you're interested in. Much of the work, however, has been in trying to actually create a sort of a more multi-dimensional recommender systems where the, the context variables are actually uh, considered as part of the, uh, the machine learning uh, process, as part of the modeling process when you build the recommendation models. So without going into a lot of uh, the details of various approaches, you can sort of categorize them maybe broadly speaking as extensions of the standard collaborative filtering. Certainly methods based on pre-filtering and post-filtering sort of fall into that categories. Um, yeah, there are heuristic distance-based approaches where extend things like uh, you know item item or user user uh, collaborative filtering approaches like k-nearest neighbor approaches, and there are many approaches that try to extend uh, matrix factorization. So there is um, tensor factorization where uh, rather than just looking at users and items, you incorporate context, and then you try to learn. Uh, basically, these higher uh, do higher order tensor factorization to find the uh, latent factors. Um, there is context aware matrix factorization where you integrate the idea of context as part of the optimization process when we learn those factor matrices that we were talking about, and uh, factorization machines uh, where you have users and items, but uh, you you throw in the, all of the different context variables also as sort of dimensions or features. And, uh, and then you uh, factorize this larger extended matrix. So all of those are examples of methods that people have used, some of them quite successfully in trying to deal with uh, context in representational uh, uh, kind of a framework. So um, I want to focus more, however, on the interactional view of context. And that's what I'm going to do actually for the remainder of this talk, including a couple of uh, approaches that uh, we have worked on in my group. The interactional view of context basically uh, says that there is no explicit representation of context. So context are not, context is not represented using some external set of variables, but in fact, uh, it's represented using some small sort of latent states that explains user behavior. What we can observe is the user's behavior and user's interaction with uh, items, but we do not observe the context itself directly. So the task here becomes often trying to infer what the context is. And usually we use some kind of a stochastic process, uh, a probabilistic modeling approach. Uh, or even matrix factorization could be used potentially to, to try to do that. So one uh, general approach is uh, the idea of representing context features as kind of these latent variables that you infer from the user interaction data. So here's the context model is inferred, is not observed, but it is static. So you learn it from historical data. And then the user dynamics are reflected in terms of changes in these latent preference states. So you may, for example, uh, one particular set of latent preference states might dictate your behavior when you're interacting with an item, but when you switch to a different kind of a uh, uh, preference state, let's say I'm going from exercising to relaxing or something along those lines, then uh, the, the system can sort of then uh, my preferences would be reflected accordingly. 
So you can imagine, for instance, that you have items and you have users and you have some set of latent factors that represent my preference states. And the idea is to sort of learn these. Uh, so we don't observe these directly, but we learn them from these observations. And there are different methods uh, to do this. For example, uh, you know, it, uh, we, in my previous work, we have used, for example, uh, probabilistic latent semantic analysis or other kinds of approaches where probabilistic, you really try to model these latent factors. But there, there are other methods, including methods based on matrix factorization, where you could do something similar. But the main idea is that the preference of a user for different items is encoded in, in the user's membership in these latent classes. And we try to measure this based on the available uh, historical data. And uh, then we would have sort of a characterization of the associations between the, the items and these latent states and the users and these latent states uh, and therefore the interactions. So, one example implementation uh, that I want to talk about, which also brings in some ad additional types of data in addition to just collaborative data, is uh, this particular piece of work where we use this idea to create a contextual music recommender system. So here we used metadata in specifically social tags or collaborative tagging data uh, for songs to build topic models representing these latent preference states. So the latent preference states there were the topics or the, the latent variables that were derived from these tags. Uh, by tags, I, I mean the user uh, specified tags, basically social tags that you can provide. In this case, we use last FM, which some of you may be familiar with that, where it allows users to give tags uh, to um, um, to associate tags with albums or artists or specific songs and so on. But the goal was then to uh, look at these, uh, these topics and look at the user's playlist and look at the main uh, uh, topics that are emerging for each one of those songs in, within the playlist. And therefore you can th think about a playlist as kind of a a sequence of topics. And in this case, the sequence of topics would represent uh, different contextual states. Now you can imagine that one playlist, uh, you know, if all of the songs the user is playing are all within the same sort of the preference state, maybe they all represent the same exact uh, contextual state. But a longer playlist, especially a playlist that may involve different user activities, uh, let's say going from exercising to relaxing to dinner, etc. You might have a situation where that playlist or that user activity session uh, might in fact span multiple different preference states. And the goal is to try to adapt the system's recommendations to these changes corresponding to the changes in that context. So, and of course, a usage scenario for this is to be able to infer users context and then recommend a set of songs that are appropriate to that context. And if you observe a change in the context, then of course you change your the type of recommendations you're making according to that context. Here is sort of the general framework or the general architecture of the system we used for our data set, basically human compiled playlists, such as the one we were just looking at. We used uh, LastFM to get the top tags associated with different songs. Then we use the uh, uh, latent Dirichlet allocation, the topic modeling approach uh, to identify the topics for these tags. Uh, and then we get topic-based sequences uh, because remember each playlist or each user session, activity session is kind of a sequence of songs. So what each song can be represented essentially as a sequence of, uh, or a set of tags then we can find sequences of these uh, and set of topics, basically, then we can find sequences of topics representing uh, these playlists. And then the idea was to do some kind of a sequential pattern mining. Uh, 
So um, we use sequential pattern mining as kind of an extension of this notion of association rule mining, but other methods can also be used in here, including uh, Markov models, for example. But the idea is to be able to use those sequences of topics to make a topic prediction. What would be the next topic uh, based on the user's current set of activities? Once you can predict the topic, then you can, uh, you can uh, generate recommendations based on the user session that corresponds to the current topic. And you can also observe changes in uh, the topics based on users' interaction, ongoing interaction with the system. So latent durational allocation, by the way, uh, I, th I think most of you are probably familiar with that idea, but it's a generative probabilistic model where documents are represented as sort of random mixture over uh, latent topics. So each, each document is basically represented as a, uh, as a probability, probability distribution over a set of topics. And then there's those uh, topics are characterized as a distribution over different words in the data. Typically, this is uh, applied in the, in the context of documents where you have documents and then you have uh, text features, the keywords in the documents uh, uh, as features. In our context, we are using songs kind of as, a, as documents. And then uh, the, the features are the tags that are associated with these songs. So um, this is sort of the, uh, the uh, plate representation of the uh, latent durational allocation, which I'm not going to get into in too much detail. But so that's a basic idea. So you have uh, uh, basically, the uh, latent topics are generated from the topmost frequent tags that are associated with the songs. Um, uh, these are the tags that uh, are in, from last FM. And for LDA purpose, we assume songs are sort of the documents and tags are the words within the documents. In this case, tags the, uh, are features associated with the songs. And then we find the probability distributions. Here's an example of some of the topics in, uh, in one of the runs, I guess. So you can see that topic one, for instance, so this is one of those latent variables that I was talking about. Um, some of the top uh, features or tags uh, are listed in here. And you can see that sort of topic one represents maybe ambient instrumental sort of uh, chill music, atmospheric music. Um, and while topic two seems to represent more Latin or Spanish uh, kind of a genre, and uh, maybe topic six is more um, mellow music, uh, you know, soft music and so on. One nice thing about tags is that it's not just content, that it doesn't just describe the contents of items, but also it, it uh, can encode additional kinds of things. Like for example, the user's uh, mood when they are listening, let's say, or their uh, uh, perception of, uh, for example, you know, whether the song is melancholy or mellow or sad or happy, etc. So all of those get captured in, in these topics. Now, once you have the topics, then uh, let's say that this is a playlist. So I don't show you the songs in here, but I'm showing you for each song some of the top tags that are associated with these songs. And then the dominant topic associated with these tags from the LDA model. And you can see that in this particular playlist, this is one playlist from a single user, uh, the topic six is pretty dominant, and then it starts to change a little bit. So then it becomes seven and the topic 23 also starts appearing and 20. And uh, so you see a little bit of a change in here uh, after a while. And you're going from like single song like writer and guitar and rock to more like alternative and acoustic uh, and so on. So that's an example of the kind of thing I'm talking about. You can think of it as a sequence of topics and these sequence of topics, at some point you can see a, a kind of a change in user's preferences or user's preference state. Now for the purpose of our um, system here, we take a topic 
representation of sequence. So basically, the sequence of uh, of topics, uh, so the sets of topics that you see in here, and you can break these up into uh, uh, into multiple uh, sequences. So for example, I can have six, and then six, and then either six, twenty, or uh, or twenty three. So those three options become three different sequences. So I end up with a whole bunch of sequences like this, and this is where I can apply uh, sequential pattern mining to, uh, to these sequences in order to learn uh, basically some general patterns in this data. Um, so uh, one nice thing about using this more aggregate level, so looking at topic view, uh, uh, rather than uh, individual songs, is that also you increase kind of uh, the, uh, the coverage and the diversity of recommendations. So if you try to do song recommendations with individual songs, it's a very difficult task to, uh, to exactly predict what the next song should be. Um, and, uh, and you could uh, also reduce accuracy because, uh, uh, because you, know, you may be able to predict with you know, low precision, a particular song, but uh, uh, but there may be many other songs that would be appropriate that would be missed in that case. So you're kind of reducing the recall. Um, so topic level aggregation actually really helps in this case because often, uh, you know, there are many uh, songs that could be appropriate as the next recommendation that could match the current uh, context or current uh, uh, topic. There are different ways of actually using this uh, idea, but uh, in uh, this work that I'm uh, describing in here, we computed the context score basically based on the user's uh, hi interaction history. So for a given song, we would basically compute. So for a given song and given some uh, sequence of activities of a user, let's say HU, we would then compute uh, sort of the suitability of song given the current context. And uh, once you have that, then you could uh, rank basically the recommendations based on, uh, based on this context score. We could also combine this. In our work, we actually combine, we use the linear combination of the standard sort of collaborative filtering k-nearest neighbor score, prediction score with this context score in order to generate the final uh, rating or recommendation for uh, for songs. Now you can um, I'll give you an example of a couple of uh, uh, data sets in here that we use. Sorry, I'm just checking the time in here to make sure. Um, so um, here's take your a, time, Bob. Don't, I'm sorry? don't rush it. Take your take your time. Don't rush it just because of the All time. Right. Thank you. Um, so here was a data set uh, of, from Art of the Mix, which is a bunch of playlists from 28,000, 29,000 users and different songs. And then, of course, we got the uh, uh, tags from Last FM. And we used a window size of seven songs uh, to determine kind of the user's activity session based on which we would then generate a prediction, right? So for Predicting the next topic based on the current set of topics, here is uh, some of the results. So this is for topic prediction, not individual song prediction. So um, I uh, didn't uh, let, got rid of some one slide that had some of these details, but basically uh, SP is the sequential model, sequential pattern mining approach that we use. CSP is the same thing except using contiguous sequential patterns rather than open sequential patterns. So this sort of insists uh, that uh, your patterns are contiguous sequ uh, sequences of songs or topics in this case. All case order is a sort of a generalization of these where you start with a window size of seven, but uh, you, know, uh, you may not be able to generate a prediction if you have seven items in a sequence, particularly if you're using CSP. Um, so if you can't generate enough uh, recommendations in that case uh, uh, to meet a certain threshold, uh, 
then you can reduce the window size to six and then that, let's say to five and then to two. So you use basically different uh, orders, um, different uh, window sizes to try to generate the predictions. Um, and of course, if you generate things with the window size of one, um, so reduce it all the way down to one, then uh, you have kind of equivalent of uh, like a first order Markov model at that point. So in that case, you're reducing your precision, but increasing your recall. So there's a trade-off between these two. So in any case, we also uh, looked at the Markov model in here, which doesn't quite perform as well when you look at precision. Uh, when you look at, uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, the recall, uh, it, uh, it does a little bit better. So this is for topic prediction, but but we can actually do a pretty good job of predicting topics um, when you're talking about basically these changes in context. For an individual song recommendation using that uh, context score that I was describing earlier, um, we compared it, con our method context aware model to user based KNN to a content based approach where we are just using the tags basically to uh, to do the content generated uh, based prediction, and also uh, a matrix factorization approach. This is a Bayesian uh, probabilistic uh, matrix factorization, and um, uh, and you can see that overall, you know, this context aware model does uh, better. Not when you're dealing with very small number of songs, but when you're generating larger number of songs, then you start seeing the the impact in terms of hit ratio. Okay, so I want to maybe next uh, five to 10 minutes, uh, if you have time to uh, talk a little bit about a different approach. Uh, this idea of dynamic context adaptation when you're dealing with kind of real time online uh, interactions. So here's a situation where our, our, our uh, context is actually dynamic. Uh, so we don't have, we can't just learn a static sort of, uh, con uh, set of uh, latent uh, context variables based on historical data because we have to sort of learn on the fly. So we are talking about kind of a reinforcement learning approach in this case. So you have a situation where you're trying to learn user's preference model in real time based on the user's interaction with the system and in addition to that, we want to be able to, of course, uh, be able to adapt to changes in context. So identifying changes in context and adapt to them. So this is a more obviously a more difficult uh, kind of a situation, a much more difficult problem because there's a lot of unknown in here. Um, so when you're dealing with the interactive recommendation scenario, you can imagine that you are basically uh, the user is given a recommendation based on the system. User gives a feedback, right? Let's say a thumbs up or thumbs down or a rating or a click through or something along those lines. And the system estimates the utility of the item based on the user's past profile or user's uh, feedback and uh, generates a recommendation. But in addition to that, what we want to do is to be able to detect a change in context. So for example, let's say the user has uh, been looking at maybe giving positive feedback to some songs that are similar in nature, but then starts giving negative feedback consistently to some similar songs. So that means there's some change in context. So we wanna be able to identify that context change, determine the effect of that context, and then sort of update the utility estimate before generating the recommendation. So all of this happens kind of in real time as you observe the user's feedback. Well, uh, the general idea of course in here is that you try to maximize the utility for each step. Uh, and in the context of recommendation, a recommendation from the system is basically the idea of uh, obtaining the highest estimated expected utility for the item. And the notion of a reward here is the rating from the user or, uh, or it may not be a rating, it may be selection of an item or a click through and so on, but uh, the user's feedback basically. So 
if the system gives a recommendation and the users, let's say, gives a thumbs up, that would be a reward, right? And if the user gives a thumbs down, that uh, would be a negative reward, sort of a, a contributes to the risk versus the reward. So maximizing the reward over the interaction session, over several interactions, is sort of the goal here. And in order to be able to do this in real time, um, you need to sort of resort to this idea of this sort of changing between uh, two modes, the exploitation mode and the exploration mode. So exploitation basically refers to the idea of choosing the most profitable item, the item with the highest utility and sort of giving that to the user. Exploration, when you choose other items, perhaps at random, perhaps based on some criteria, just to be able to acquire more information from the user. Remember, you, you give things to the user, the user gives you some feedback. So you can use that feedback to try to learn something more about user preferences, whether that feedback is positive or negative. That's the exploration. So the idea is to sort of switch back and forth between this exploration and exploitation uh, in order to be able to learn user's preference model. This is often uh, done using a class of algorithms called multi-armed bandit algorithms. You may be familiar with uh, this idea. The name uh, bandit comes from uh, slot machines who, that are called bandits sometimes. So a single slot machine is a single arm bandit, right? You pull the arm. Of course, these days, you know, these high tech ones, you don't pull the arm, but you push a button, but it used to be a pull, a pull of the arm. And then it would give you uh, basically, uh, you put in a coin, you pull the arm and either you win something or you don't. And you get a payout, payoff basically, or a payoff from, uh, from that uh, interaction. Multi-arm bandits, you can imagine that you're sitting in front of like a row of slot machines. And let's say you have the row to yourself. So you keep going and you're putting in coins and pulling arms and you're observing the payouts from these machines. And if you see one machine that's giving you more uh, a higher reward, maybe you remember that, and then uh, you start playing that machine a little bit more than other machines, right? So this is the idea of exploration versus exploitation. You explore by trying different arms of different machines for a while. And then when you notice that uh, some of these machines are paying out more, uh, then you try to exploit that and uh, use those arms. Now, in our context, when we are dealing with recommendation, the set of arms is really kind of a representation of candidate items that we could recommend. By representation, I mean representation in terms of some sort of features. And then the reward is the user's feedback, right? Either the ratings or click through uh, on these recommended items. There are a number of different solutions uh, to this multi-arm bandits. Uh, the, uh, the most common ones are epsilon greedy approaches, upper confidence bound UCB algorithms and Thompson sampling. Um, I'm not gonna get in too much detail in that. Um, the work I am describing here, we used uh, Thompson sampling because it has some interesting properties and it usually does um, pretty well um, compared to these other ones. But the idea here is that you select uh, a, uh, the arm based on its probability of optimality. So you start from some uh, probability distribution, let's say theta, usually it's a Gaussian distribution uh, that represents sort of your initial, uh, your initial estimated, uh, let's say, uh, uh, preference model of the user. Uh, initially, if of, of course, it's at random. You draw from this uh, distribution and then you uh, observe the uh, reward based on uh, the, the expected, you compute the expected utility and ex the, the expected reward for that item. Uh, and then you update your distribution based on uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, feedback from the user. So each time through this loop, you sort of updating this distribution, it becomes more and more attenuated to user preferences. Uh, as you go. Uh, so you're going from sort of a greater exploration to greater exploitation as you go through this. And um, without going into too much technical detail here, 
uh, we assume here that, uh, that we have a linearly parameterized bandit where the expected reward basically is computed as a linear combination of a set of features and this uh, uh, preference distribution. And this set of features, by the way, could be is, is some set of features that represent the items. It could be that uh, there are existing features, like, let's say tags, like we were talking about earlier, or maybe uh, keywords um, or some uh, part, specific uh, set of features, uh, relational type features associated with items, or it could be latent features. Uh, and in fact, uh, in our work, we use the latent features that we obtain through uh, principal component analysis to represent basically items uh, as uh, in a smaller um, um, set of uh, latent dimensions. All right, so um, what about, so all of this is just to be able to learn the user preference model interactively, right? So far, we haven't talked about changes in context, but changes in context happen when you notice a change in preferences. So let's say that we have, uh, this is a portion of a user's interaction with the system and giving scores, for example, from one to a hundred or skipping some songs that are being recommended. But then at some point, let's say you start getting uh, these recommendations and, uh, and you're seeing that the ratings drop dramatically, let's say significantly. So no longer these songs that are being recommended based on your current model uh, are uh, being, uh, you know, being rewarded essentially. So some change happened in your user's context and therefore the current preference model is no longer appropriate. So what we want to be able to do is to identify this change. Um, so, and the way we can do that is by taking, let's say a window of size N within the user's sort of activity, uh, two consecutive windows of size N, and then sort of observe uh, sort of at, and as we go through this uh, this user's activity session, sort of we compute distances uh, step by step between these these two windows. Each one of these windows, you can think of it as a probability distribution over items. So this is sort of computing a distance between two distributions, and we can in fact use things like KL divergence or other methods that allow you to to obtain the distance between two distributions. But the I, the goal is that we can use that distance computation to do change point analysis. So if this distance becomes uh, significant in some particular way, either based on some specified threshold or based on statistical analysis, we could then determine that that's a change in context. And if that change in context occurs, then what we want to do is actually kind of forget about our previous model and start learning again, and start, start doing the exploration exploitation again. Because if we don't, we have to uh, remember our theta distribution, uh, that, that our preference model. It will take a long time to sort of change that enough to be able to quickly adapt to the new context. So if there has in fact been a dramatic change in context in our preference state, we want to be able to uh, make a quicker change uh, in our model. So, um, to do the evaluation, of course, for, for something like this, we had to do simulation. And to do simulation of the idea of a user changing context, we actually got two separate user profiles, let's say U1 and U2, and concatenated them, and then treat this as a single user, right? So in our simulation, this would be uh, one of our test sessions where we look at one window, uh, which actually was initially user one profile, and then we see the change to, uh, to user two profile. And uh, the goal would be, of course, to be able to observe or identify the change uh, that occurs in here, and then uh, make the appropriate change in context using our, our multi-arm bandit model. You can see the result in here. In this case, this Yahoo music data set. And what we see there's the results in here is the top line in here is the uh, optimal recommender. So if you imagine we had an Oracle that always gave the item with the maximum utility, uh, 
that would be uh, this model here. And by the way, you see that uh, the utility overall, the average utility overall goes down. Part of the reason for that going down as you go through is because uh, we never recommend the same item twice. So as we go uh, through the sessions, we have actually fewer and fewer things to, to be able to recommend. So the overall utility goes down. But the important thing is that when you reach the change point at iteration 30 in here, you can see that immediately jumps back up to the highest utility. Uh, and so there's basically, in this case, there is, uh, there is almost zero time in being able to adapt to the, to the change in context. On the other hand, if you look at, let's say, a standard user base KNN, you can see that uh, mm -hmm. there is a big drop in utility and it doesn't really recover. And if you look at uh, uh, standard bandits without change detection, so you get the big drop in utility, and then uh, you know again it doesn't recover. But if you look at the context uh, contextual recommender using this Thompson sampling approach that uh, I mentioned, you see a much quicker recovery of uh, the utility after this change point. So the whole goal in here is to be able to. Uh, not only learn a preference model sort of in real time, but then be able to quickly adapt to changes in context and recover quickly um, uh, when that context changes. All right, so I probably went over the time that I was expecting to go, but um, let me just conclude in here. So context awareness, um, we know from a lot of work that's been done in this area over the years that can help improve the utility of recommendations for users essentially make recommendations more useful, both in practical sense and also in terms of accuracy. Uh, there are many contexts of where recommender systems are kind of hybrid systems that integrate different knowledge sources, including semantic information, social content. And we saw some examples of these in a couple of uh, examples that I went over today. There are lots of interesting areas to still explore, including developing effective methods for detecting change in context. Uh, so I didn't really go through that, but there are lots of different methods to try to do this. More effective methods to integrate or distinguish between different types of preference changes. So we talked about changes in preference state, but sometimes you have short-term preference changes. Sometimes you have episodic or cyclical changes. Sometimes you have long-term preference changes. So for example, I may have been interested in certain type of item in the past, but I'm just no longer interested in it. So I can just dis discount sort of those old preferences if I know that this is a long-term change. Also better integration of offline models with fully dynamic uh, models using re reinforcement learning. So kind of combining the two approaches I was talking about in some way where you could have learned models from historical data, but then combine it with reinforcement learning to be able to adapt more quickly to contextual changes. All right, thank you very much. And uh, I, if you have time, a little bit of time for questions, uh, I'd be happy to try to answer. Thank you, Bamshad. Uh, brilliant as always. Um, it was really nice to kind of get this uh, journey through the work that you've been doing in contextual recommenders. While the others are maybe thinking up their questions, um, I have one, um, which is um, you know you you use um, topic models uh, in the first case that you showed us. Um, now, one of the things that has always kind of uh, bugged me about topic models is the fact that. Uh, you know, even in documents, you could have topic switching happening from one word to the next, uh, right? And from a context perspective, we wouldn't expect that to be the case. So you're not really, uh, you know, topic models are not taking the neighborhood into account when they're assigning topics as such. Um, you know, so um, do you have any kind of thoughts on how, I mean, maybe you already, you know, handled that in some way um, that we can actually uh, not have this kind of context switching, right? Because now you're saying topics are really the context. Um, did you see evidence of that in the in the uh, uh, music analysis that you were doing or is it not so much of a problem? So uh, 
So you're saying when you you're you're saying you don't include the neighborhood information. You're talking about like collaborative information. Oh, like other uh, users that is. No, so I was actually thinking more about say you had a, 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 a you know a document and you were basically deriving its topic uh, representation. Uh, essentially, when you look at uh, the words that have been assigned to different topics within the document, uh, yeah. if you look at the actual sequence, uh, you find that you know uh, a topic could switch uh, from one word to the next almost, right? Because you're treating in a document it, uh, as a word of uh, a bag of words. So you, you're already ignoring the sequence. Whereas, uh, you know, in, in the contextual recommendation case, when you're looking at a, a playlist, uh, you know, if you were seeing a lot of switching from one context to the next, that doesn't sound natural, right? In some ways, that, yeah. like you said, you know, you'll, you'll ease out of one and go to the next. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, I was just wondering whether you had kind of looked at, uh, you know, the, the uh, neighborhood in terms of, you know, the previous song had this topic mix or context mix, I guess. And then the next song had this context mix in it, uh, you know, uh, yeah, so should so we really be taking out, you know, the history into account of, of contexts to smooth yeah, out? So, I mean, we, we, we have explored that question, um, yeah. but, uh, but uh, you know, I, I don't have anything to report on it in terms of right. uh, like results. Right. So it's right. a difficult problem, right? Uh, but you're right, you, you could, uh, um, uh, so we have explored the idea of these latent topic models in various ways. So mm -hmm. the LDA model I talked about is like one approach. We have actually used like probabilistic latent semantic analysis, just applied to user interactions without considering the content or features of the items mm -hmm. uh, to, to basically look at behavioral changes and do something very similar to what I was describing in terms of looking at a user's session or activity session, for example, and then looking at uh, changes in these, uh, these contexts. When you look at the behavioral data, you get much more smooth, uh, smoother transitions. So mm -hmm. it's this idea of observing, maybe slowly changing from one preference state to another state. You s that's, that's much more obvious, especially if you're looking at longer sessions. Mm -hmm. For uh, for the data set that I was describing, you're right that it's it's not as uh, obvious. So, first of all, uh, the data is not very clean. <laughs> so, a lot of these uh, uh, playlists, you they are not necessarily sequences of things. They're just sort of things that uh, somebody put up there. We yeah. try to do some cleaning of that data in that sense, but. Uh, but you can still, okay, in some of these examples, you can see that uh, in especially longer playlists, you can see that there are changes, right? So somebody was listening to some kind of a streaming session and slowly changed their preference. Right, uh, right. So kind and, of a concept uh, creep kind of thing. It's, it's a slowly yes. change. To yeah. what degree that exists or not, obviously that depends on the data set, but mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, and on the uh, a couple of slides before your last slide, uh, where you had the graph that was showing the Thompson sampling, uh, you know, versus uh, the more traditional multi amp. Yeah, so sorry, just uh, just that graph uh, further down to the to the right towards the end. Uh, you know the results of your your Thompson sampling versus yeah this, this? here yeah. So uh, we see that you know the contextual recommender seems to be kind of going down quicker, right, uh, compared to the standard bandit, uh, uh, you know, and then it kind of picks up after the switch in context. But is there is there a particular reason why in the first half, just before thirty, right, we are seeing that the contextual recommender is doing a little worse than uh, the standard bandit bandit? If I read this correctly, is that? Is there a particular reason for that, or is that just an artifact of the data? I think that's just uh, some degree of randomness there, ah, uh, okay. because you're doing these random distributions you, you start with. So, okay. uh, so I think so. These are, but before the change point, these are essentially uh, pretty, pretty mm -hmm. much the same in terms of performance. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So the these the the difference you see in here is not really significant. Mm 
Right, yeah. right. But you do see significant uh, change After in terms the context, of uh, recovery, basically. Yeah. Which was kind of the point of this particular graph was to show the recovery, how quickly the system can recover by right. adapting to these changes. Right, yeah, yeah. Now this is great, uh, very interesting work. And in fact, it's it's very relevant to a project we are doing in, in the B2B marketing space. Where, in what space? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, in a B2B marketing uh, space, we are building a recommender, and uh, you know the, it's it's important to understand the intent of the of the customer, right, right, um, yeah. and to try and get that right. And uh, you know, so so this is some, definitely something that we are going to look at and see how we can apply there. Um, well, I mean, we are continuing work in this area of using multi arm bandits. So right. there's ways of collaborating. I'm always yeah, happy to, uh, that'd be great. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely. I think that's, uh, I'll be reaching out to you. Um, what about, uh, you know, the the, the uh, user interface from a recommender system? I know this is not, you know, necessarily a space that you have uh, focused on, but uh, of course there are folks in the Rexus community that look at that, and, you know, in the end of the day, uh, it's a very yeah. important aspect, right? I mean, the algorithms can be just uh, amazingly intelligent, but, uh, you know, they, they fall apart because of the user interface. I mean, what's your view on that? Well, I agree with that, um, and I have done nothing about it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry to say, but well, I mean, I, I'm being a little bit, uh, you know, I'm joking a little bit, but uh, yeah. So, I mean, uh, yes, we talked about the algorithms and uh, and models, making the models more accurate, all of those things. Uh, but none of these systems can be successful unless uh, they can actually present things to the user in the right way, right? And, uh, and that's a general problem with personalization, right? In all aspects of personalization, what, to what degree do you personalize? What things do you personalize? In what way do you present the users? How many items do you recommend? Uh, you know, and the problem is that uh, this is highly uh, domain dependent. If you think about uh, the way, uh, I don't know, Pandora recommends items, you know, uh, obviously the interface is very important, but the way their interface works, where you can sort of listen to some particular song and then give thumbs up or thumbs up or skip, that dictates to some extent how the user interacts with the system. But then those recommendations sort of change the user behavior. So there is this mutually reinforcing relationship between, uh, between the, uh, the, the interface that the user interacts with um, and um, the way they interact with that uh, system and, uh, and the items that, uh, that are being presented. If you compare that to Netflix, for example, it's a completely different kind of a uh, user interface, right? You have these rows uh, based on categories and maybe they're, they're personalized. The ranking is different for mm -hmm. different user, perhaps based on your uh, personal preferences. Um, so, um, so, I mean, these, these companies spend a great deal of time and effort in trying to figure out what is the right way to present things to users. And that makes all the difference. So you could have the best recommender system, but if you're not uh, presenting to the user in the right way, uh, it's not gonna be successful. This is why all of these from Google to Facebook to Amazon to Netflix, they all have, um, huge uh, uh, groups that just focus on uh, user interaction and uh, user interface. They, they have big UX groups basically that, uh, that sort of uh, try to integrate the recommendations into interacting with the user. And uh, one of the things that uh, you know your last uh, application reminded me of, uh, you know, with the uh, dynamic nature of recommendation was these conversational recommenders, uh, you know, that uh, Robert Burke and uh, the folks yeah. in Ireland, in fact, were working on. Um, you know, uh, is there a resurgence in in the idea of uh, conversational recommenders right now? I mean, it's I, I don't hear a lot about them now. Yeah, there there has been some work. Um... And uh, I guess what we used to call conversational recommender systems, mm -hmm. uh, people don't necessarily call them conversational recommender systems anymore, but may uh, more just the idea of interactive recommendation, right? Right, right. And uh, 
reinforcement or learning in general has become much more important. So mm -hmm. the old style conversational recommended systems were much more like feature, feature and knowledge based, right? Right, right. So you had you have various features that a user would then, uh, let's say, interact Pretty. with. You could mm -hmm. go say, hey, I want, uh, uh, I don't know, something uh, cheaper, for example, if within this price range, not that price range, or I want something with these features, not those features. And then the recommender would sort of uh, adapt. So the idea is similar, right? You're interactively trying to adapt to the user preference model. You you're, learn the user preference model in that case, based on some explicit sort of features. Here we're yeah. talking about sort of doing that um, in a much more dynamic way without necessarily having some observable set of mm. um, feature. Great, because we had actually built a, a recommender system around recipes at one stage for a startup in California, where you'd open your fridge and take a photograph of your fridge and you extract all the ingredients you have there and start recommending what you could cook, right? Which, uh, you know, sounds like a great app. <laughs> um, and there we were actually- that Sounds like a dangerous uh, app, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there we were thinking about, you know, maybe critiquing on different aspects of the rec recommended recipes. And I was wondering whether there was, you know, I mean, is, is that, I guess, uh, in recommendation of complex uh, uh, items, that's still valid, right? I mean, the, the kind of critiquing that was being done at a feature level. Yeah, absolutely. Or is uh, there something new uh, that's come out that, you know, I've, I've obviously been a little, uh, you know, far away from the community now. So has there been any other well, um, answers there? So actually for the past several years, we've been, I and a couple of other people have been running this workshop at Recommender Systems Conference uh -huh. called the uh, Recommendation in Complex Scenarios. Ah, okay. So I should uh, look up it's, that. It's pretty general, but the way we have sort of tried to uh, characterize complex scenarios is based on complex inputs or complex outputs. Mm -hmm. So you can think about that uh, maybe a menu recommendation or, uh, or recipe generation or things like that would be an example of complex output, right? Because you're trying to, you're not just trying to recommend an item, you're actually trying to compose a combination of things, right? That have to make sense. So there are constraints involved. Uh, there are a variety of other things that are in, that are involved. Package recommendation is another example of that where you try to recommend a package of things that sort of go right. together. Right. Uh, fashion uh, recommendation is also another area where uh, I know you have done some work. Go with the dress. Has, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, Achintya, you've got a question. Do you want to just unmute and ask? Them? Okay. Um, I may need to. Yeah. Let me see. Yeah, sure. So, hello? Yeah, yeah Achintya, go, go on. Okay, great. Uh, so, sir, a few slides back, you uh, showed an example where uh, uh, after recommending a few correct uh, items, the user uh, starts to go on other path as in uh, dislikes uh, the recommendations. However, what happens when a new user comes and uh, the general uh, uh, recommendations that are given to him, he doesn't like any of them. So the score is zero, zero or skipped or something. In that scenario, uh, will the model uh, start giving random suggestions or uh, will it keep following the pattern as uh, later you showed us that uh, uh, with the recommendations that the uh, user will get, uh, the precision or the accuracy will uh, drop. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that question. Yeah, so I mean, that's a difficult problem, right? Because if you have a situation where the user is always giving either positive or negative uh, feedback, right? So let's say it doesn't, just doesn't like anything you're giving him. Uh, then the system in, is, uh, is not, so, the, uh, basically the exploitation part uh, results in, uh, in giving bad recommendations, sort of becomes kind of a feedback loop. So this is a problem with uh, this some of these exploration exploitation approaches. So one nice thing about this, uh, 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 this Thompson sampling approach is that you could actually uh, update you could actually change it so that if there's, for example, if uh, 
you, you go for a while, you could actually change your original distribution. So let me go back in here. So we start with this distribution, right, theta. Um, and as you go, you keep, you keep updating this, right? At some point, you could randomize this. So it gives you uh, kind of this uh, simulated annealing kind of an effect where you're, you're maybe stuck in some kind of a local optima, and then you jump out based on some randomization. So that's one way to try to deal with the kind of situation that you were, you were talking about. But yeah, but that in general, the user feedback is in uh, uh, is what determines uh, uh, the system behavior, basically, right? During the exploration part. Yeah, thank you. And, and this whole point of exploration versus exploitation, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, people. At, at least a few years ago, they were talking about this whole information bubble that you can get into, where. Uh, you know, Amazon could be dressing you rather than you, right? Because Amazon is deciding what they're showing you when you go to buy clothes there. Um, you know, again, I guess this is more a UI and a, and a strategy issue rather than an algorithmic issue. But uh, yeah. you know, is there thoughts about building this into the algorithms that there should always be an exploration aspect of um, Recommendation. Right. So, I mean, actually, this exploration exploitation might be a way to uh, address some of those problems <clears throat> because most of the uh, model based approaches that we know about, and in fact, we have recently done some work in this area trying to determine over, the, uh, over time what is the impact of the recommender system on user preferences, right? So, and you can actually uh, observe the, the changes in user preferences based on the recommendations. So if you assume, for example, the user accepts the recommendations you're giving him or her, right? And then you uh, look at, let's say, a number of steps down the road. Uh, where is the, uh, when you compare users sort of preference model at the beginning and at the end, mm -hmm. what are the changes that have been made to that preference model? And if you look at all of the users, uh, then what happens? So one of the reasons we were looking at this problem was to try to see if you can model this idea of maybe a, a you know, filter bubble to some extent. Uh, does the user get into kind of like a rut basically? Uh, do users generally move in this uh, particular direction? And what we found is that in a lot of uh, methods that we use, including k nearest neighbor, matrix factorization, et cetera, the end result is that everybody sort of gravitates towards the most popular items, <laughs> right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, that's right. So, so that becomes sort of the filter bubble, uh, mm -hmm. not necessarily some localized uh, thing, but everybody sort of, uh, so this is a kind of a manifestation of the, what we call the popularity bias, right? right. Right. And if it affects all the users sort of uh, in the long term in many of these systems. The exploration exploitation actually might be able to try to help with that a little bit. So if you can incorporate kind of a reinforcement learning components to some of these model-based approaches, it might help uh, be yeah. able to get people sort of out of those. Yeah, very interesting. Problems. In fact, it reminds me of uh, Barry Smith when he was doing his PhD, he had a, had a, a paper, I think in each guy called learning to forget. <laughs> and maybe that's yeah. what we, yeah. we need to do, right? In the nearest neighbor type approaches is to you know, forget certain I aspects. I remember that paper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, funny how memory works there, but it took me back, I guess, uh, 20 years, right? <laughs> but I'm sure the, you know, wonderful to also see sequence pattern algorithms making a comeback, right? Because I remember the early work that you had done in uh, recommendation was uh, using sequence pattern uh, discovery and, and, and clustering based approaches, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. So, oh. so thank you, Bamshad. I know we've been uh, very unfair to keep you uh, longer uh, from your bed. I know it is past uh, 11 o'clock at this point, probably uh, closer to 11.30. No, no worries. Um, uh, and uh, you know, we really and, uh, enjoy talking to you guys. And, uh, and uh, thank you for, for having me. Not at all. It's such a pleasure and an honor to have you. Thank you, Bamshad. Take care. Let's keep in touch on, uh, on other things. Absolutely. We will. We will. All right.